Hello, and welcome to this latest in the series of DVD tours of the National Wildlife Refuge System, America's Wildest Places. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service invites you to sit back and enjoy another armchair tour of some of the most outstanding places in the nation to see wildlife and to enjoy the great outdoors. We begin our journey just north of Boston at a place that's known as one of the Atlantic Coast's best locales to spot shorebirds and waterfowl. Parker River National Wildlife Refuge on famed Plum Island is where we're headed. Come on, let's take a closer look from the unique vantage point of an old-fashioned New England sneak boat on one of Parker River's many sloughs and marshes. The salt marshes of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge are part of the largest salt marsh system north of Long Island Sound. This biologically rich ecosystem has played an important historical role as a hunting and fishing resource. As you travel the marsh in our sneak boat, you are sharing the experience of long ago New Englanders who used these low profile boats as floating hunting blinds. Today, our sneak boat provides a front row seat for observing the marsh's wildlife. You're bound to hear about the little piping plover when you visit Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, an active sand-colored shorebird that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been working hard to restore from its threatened status. It's a special species, and Parker River has a very special role in the recovery effort. Your visit to the refuge will call for an added measure of respect for this imperiled bird of the beaches because its nesting areas are very sensitive. Here's one of the best vantage points you'll ever get to see the life of the piping plover, or plover, depending upon where you live. Among the flocks of busy shorebirds, it's easy to miss one special species, the piping plover. Piping plovers were once a common sight along the Atlantic seaboard, but the middle of the 20th century saw a dramatic drop in their numbers. Coastal development was destroying their nesting sites, increasing human disturbance, and bringing an influx of predators. In 1986, the piping plover was listed as threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act, allowing resources to be devoted to its protection and recovery. After wintering on the southeast coast of the U.S., piping plovers fly north each spring to breed. The beaches at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge provide them with precious nesting sites, relatively free from human disturbance. Each nest is a simple depression in the sand. The female lays a speckled egg every other day until there is a total clutch of four. The parent birds are easily scared off the nest, leaving the eggs exposed to the elements and to predators. For the species to rebound, 
as many eggs as possible must survive the four-week incubation period, so the piping plover nests are managed and monitored in several ways. To prevent disturbance, most of the refuge beach is closed to visitors during the nesting season. Volunteer plover wardens help to ensure compliance and tell the public about the piping plover recovery program. Exclosures are placed around the nests to protect them from coyotes, raccoons, gulls, and other predators. Persistent predators are trapped and removed. Throughout the nesting season, refuge biologists survey the beach, counting plovers, nests, and eggs, and watching for signs of predator activity. Once hatched, the piping plover chicks are active and somewhat independent, scurrying around the beach looking for insects and small crustaceans. But it will be another four weeks before they can fly. Until then, the chicks are still vulnerable to predators and human interference. Each egg, each chick, each adult is considered a vital step on the road to restoring the piping plover population. Please do your part to help the piping plover. Ever hung out in a salt marsh? When you visit Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, you'll be treated to a diversity of natural habitats, from sandy beaches and dunes to bog swamps and meandering creeks and rivers. Salt marshes are among the most productive places for birds and fish, so if you're looking for wildlife, a salt marsh is a good place to start. Here's what the folks at Parker River are doing to conserve the largest collection of Atlantic Coast salt marshes north of Long Island Sound. Sparkling salt marshes, sunlit dunes and beaches, peaceful freshwater wetlands. These varied habitats make up more than 4,600 acres of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. For all their natural beauty, each habitat has been shaped by human activity. The salt marsh is scarred with drainage ditches, relics of a time when farmers wanted this land to grow salt hay and people lived in dread of the diseases carried by mosquitoes. Coastal development has destroyed some important wildlife habitat on the barrier island. And exotic plants and animals, introduced by accident or by design for a variety of reasons, have altered the fine balance of these ecosystems, threatening our native species. Today we recognize that salt marshes are a vital and productive habitat for fish, birds, and many other creatures. As part of the largest salt marsh system north of Long Island Sound, the salt marsh at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge is especially important. As scientific knowledge has advanced, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has developed habitat management practices that are designed to correct the mistakes of the past and restore nature's balance. At Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, the marshes are being restored in partnership with the Northeast Massachusetts Mosquito Control and Wetland Management District. Small pools, known as salt pans, are being formed by plugging the ditches with low berms. Incoming tidewater is trapped in a shallow depression behind each berm, creating a salt pan. The salt pans are then connected with small, winding ditches, creating ideal habitat for small fish. And the idea is that the fish would be able to travel from the, in between the salt pans using these ditches and they'll be able to eat the mosquito larvae so it's kind of a natural control and we're hoping to move away from the chemical spraying that's happening now on the refuge. The salt pans also attract populations of crabs, shrimp, insects, and other creatures, all of which provide food for other wildlife including shorebirds, raccoons, and even coyotes. A scientific study is measuring the success of the restoration work. We're actually part of a larger study that's going on in the Northeast. There's about 10 refuges um, up and down the Atlantic coast that's restoring salt marshes with similar techniques like we are. And we're all collecting the same data. And at the end of three years, all the data is sent to a central location. And we look at whether or not the 
the restoration is having the effects that we're hoping it will. A major management challenge throughout Parker River National Wildlife Refuge is the control of invasive plant species. They may look harmless or even beautiful, but they upset the natural balance of the ecosystems by crowding out the native plant species, which wildlife rely on for food, shelter, and nesting material. Purple loosestrife seeds came to America in the ballast water of ships traveling to and from Europe and was then spread further in wildflower seed mixes. So far, it has survived every attempt to control it, including mowing, herbicides, and even prescribed burning. The solution may be in recruiting two natural enemies, the Gallerucella beetle and the Hylobius weevil. These insects are also from Europe, where they feed on purple loosestrife in their natural habitats. Cornell University studied the beetles and weevils for 10 years to make sure they would not eat other plants. Only then did Parker River National Wildlife Refuge release the insects into the marsh. It took several years, but the insects are now controlling the growth and the spread of purple loosestrife. Another major invasive plant is Phragmites, or the common reed, which has been an increasing problem since the 1970s. As with loosestrife, the refuge has used its entire arsenal of plant controls against Phragmites with mixed success. The answer may again lie in nature itself. Cornell University is studying a number of Phragmites eating insects, and there is hope for this biological control program. One of our concerns about releasing insects on the refuge is that there's two strains of Phragmites um, here. There's one that's native to the U.S. and one that's introduced from Europe and Asia. So before we release any insects, we want to make sure that they will only damage the introduced one and leave our native one alone. A newer arrival is perennial pepperweed, which was first seen on the refuge in 1996. A native of the Mediterranean, Pepperweed is extremely invasive and very hard to control. Pepperweed is currently replacing the marsh elder, and because it is salt tolerant, it could also replace the native Spartina patens, commonly known as salt meadow grass. So far, pepperweed has resisted the refuge's attempts to control it, but it is a high priority management goal. Parker River National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1942 to protect and preserve migratory waterfowl. For that purpose, three freshwater impoundments were created by diking off part of the salt marsh. And the reason why uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to do that was to create a breeding habitat for waterfowl. However, over the ensuing 50 years, we've come to realize that the, uh, this area is more of a feeding resting area than it is a production area. And uh, since that time has, has taken place, we're looking at uh, creating a, more of a natural, self-sustaining marsh system. The three freshwater pools, which are mostly dependent on rainwater, tend to silt up and fill with invasive plants. The refuge is using a variety of approaches to tackle this habitat management challenge. The dikes are mowed annually to eliminate invasive shrubs and trees and to discourage waterfowl from nesting in this high predator area. Water levels are managed in an annual cycle. Each spring, the water in the impoundments is drawn down very gradually to expose mudflats for migrating birds and to enhance the germination of emergent plants. Once a pool is dry, the bottom is sometimes disked to destroy invasive plant species and to aerate the soil. Throughout the summer, water levels are generally kept low so that mowing or disking equipment can be used around the edges of the pools. The robust vegetation is cut back so that the pools will not become overgrown and disappear. The rains of late summer and early fall are allowed to reflood the impoundments, providing foraging areas for fall waterfowl. The pools are generally kept at full capacity throughout the winter to help the decomposition of plant material. In order to mimic a natural wetland as closely as possible, there is always some variation in this cycle. During the growing season, some pools are kept at full water levels to simulate flooding, while others may be left dry for long periods to simulate drought conditions. Wildlife comes first at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, and that means active management to create optimum habitats. It takes a blend of science, ingenuity, 
and hard work to solve the problems caused by habitat loss and human impact. The team at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge encourages your support of these conservation efforts. Together, we can make a difference. One of the most stirring spring spectacles on the New England coast each spring is the arrival of osprey for another year of nest building and rearing of new life. Parker River National Wildlife Refuge is an ideal place to witness the seasonal antics of these great avian architects who build their homes on platforms and return year after year. Let's look in. Soaring over the wetlands of Parker River National Wildlife Refuge, you can see a symbol of conservation success. The osprey. These magnificent birds, with their distinctive white bellies and long, narrow wings, owe their survival in large part to Rachel Carson, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologist. In the early 1960s, Carson published her groundbreaking book, Silent Spring, which highlighted the detrimental effects of DDT and other pesticides on America's wildlife. Osprey and other birds of prey suffered the most. They ingested large concentrations of the chemicals in their food. The toxins made their eggs so fragile that they broke before hatching. The osprey population plummeted. Carson's work led to legal controls on chemicals, and the osprey have now reclaimed their place in the coastal ecosystem. After wintering in the southern states, or Central or South America, osprey migrate north to breed. Osprey arrive at the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge in April. The Palm Island Sound, full of fish, and the elevated man-made platforms provide the nesting pairs with ideal habitat. Pairs often use the same nest year after year, gradually adding to its size. Osprey nests have been found weighing nearly half a ton. The osprey soon mate, and by June, they are incubating their single clutch of eggs. The female usually lays three eggs, which take about 32 days to hatch. Then, the really hard work begins. The hungry osprey chicks stay in the nest for about eight weeks, tended mostly by the female, while the male hunts tirelessly for fish. Once the chicks learn to fly, they become independent within about a week. The osprey will stay at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge until October, when they will migrate south for the winter. The growing osprey population proves that scientific knowledge and sound conservation policy can bring a species back from the brink of extinction. Just as Rachel Carson opened the eyes of the nation, the efforts of each and every one of us can also make a difference. These four vignettes have given you just a taste of what's available for you and your family at Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. On your next trip to New England, we hope you'll stop by Plum Island for an up-close and personal look at one of America's wildest places. Our welcome mat is always out. <laughs>